Hey everyone, Patrick here. Thank you for listening or watching this week's episode of the Well Standard Podcast. Uh, the guest I am uh, interviewing, his name is Paul Jarvis, and it's going to be a great interview, especially because we're talking about entrepreneurship. So I'm going to introduce him in just a second, but uh, if you guys would do a huge favor, go to the go to the website. We've been making a few updates there, and we're posting all of the show notes. Uh, for the different episodes, and that includes uh, more information regarding the guests. It includes their uh, social media links, their website links, and so forth. Also, if uh, you listen through iTunes, it's pretty easy now to do uh, reviews. And if you guys would uh, be so gracious to, to give us a good review, that would really help us kind of continue to spread the message uh, and get the word out. So thank you. Thank you so much for that consideration. So now to my guest. So Paul uh, Jarvis is a writer and designer who uh, has... Uh, had his own company, he's been an entrepreneur for, for several decades, and he wrote a book, and his re most recent book is called Company of One, and it really explores this idea of efficiency and why bigger isn't always better in business. Now, he's worked and consulted with some kind of high-level athletes, including Steve Nash and Shaquille O'Neal, uh, and also has consulted with some big corporation clients, uh, Microsoft and Mercedes, uh, to be specific. You know, and I, and I believe that he really has had insight into what works and what doesn't. And that's why I'm really excited for you guys to learn from him. Now, currently, he's really teaching a lot of these principles through his online courses. Uh, he also does lots of podcast interviews, uh, and he also has some software available. Uh, but I think you're going to enjoy Paul. He seems like a really, really cool guy. The interview is really fun. Uh, so without further delay, here's my interview with uh, the entrepreneur, Paul Jarvis. Okay, Paul. Thanks. Thanks for joining me. It's awesome. Uh, awesome to have you on. I know you've been back. You're back uh, from some travel, and uh, and I know you're a, a busy, busy guy. And so I'm I'm excited because I think you have a unique perspective on how uh, how entrepreneurs uh, operate in in kind of our evolving uh, economy and, and society. And so welcome, welcome to the to, to the show. First off, and uh, maybe you start off by just you know giving giving us an idea of who you are and what your story is. Yeah, so I'm Paul Jarvis. I'm, I guess, most recently the author of a book called Company of One. Uh, I've worked for myself for 20 years. I've done everything from design and consulting to to companies like Microsoft to Shaquille O'Neal, which is a bit of a, which seems to span a lot of space. Um, <laughs> back to Microsoft. Uh, and lately I teach online courses. Uh, yeah, like I said, I write books and I have a couple software companies. So what's your philosophy regarding just work and, and entrepreneurship and what's, what's possible in, you know, in our, our society t uh, today when it comes to the professional? Yeah, I think, I think we're in an interesting time um, right now because even, when, even if I think about when I started, um, when I was building websites for people uh, in the 90s, it used to take probably five, six months to get an e-commerce site up and running. You had to go to the bank, you had to get a merchant account, you had to do all of these things to get to get set up. And nowadays, like a minute or two, you can have a Shopify account, you can have a PayPal account, you can set up Stripe. So I just think we live we live in an age now where technology has really made it easy for especially small businesses because a lot of this stuff used to a lot of this stuff isn't new. It just used to exist for enterprise people only in huge businesses. And nowadays, we have the tools as, as small business owners to basically compete with them. We can show up in the same place. I could self-publish a book, put it on Amazon, and it shows up in the exact same place as, as J.K. Rowling's or Stephen King, right? So I just think that what we have at our fingertips right now with, um, with the way technology is going and the accessibility of technology makes it really interesting to, to run a business and to work for yourself. So what do you? What are some examples that you've seen? Obviously, you've worked with some celebrities. You work with bigger companies. I mean, what are what are some examples of what you're seeing that is that is possible for people that they may not be aware of? Yeah, I mean, just a, a buddy of mine, Mark Johns, is an illustrator, and he can sell hundreds of his paintings and prints around the world to people simply by using things like Instagram. My friend um, Shauna Russell, who's a painter. Could probably this doesn't help for audio people but you can see in the corner there's a there's a painting of one of my pets there she has a following of tens of thousands of people online and she opens up her cart for commissions 15 minutes every i don't know four or five months and she fills her commission slots in 15 minutes and this is just she uses social really well she uses her mailing list really well and just doing things like this and these people 
aren't big businesses. They're, they're like, they're, in the case of these two people, they're just artists, right? And they can do these things. They don't even need to be nerds <laughs> like me to set all this stuff up. They can just have a Shopify or a PayPal account or a Gumroad account. So, do, so what do you, I mean, if you were to narrow in on what the, what their advantage is, what, what's kind of the common, the common theme? Is it, is it marketing? Is it the, the tools that they're using? It's a, is it the philosophy? Is it them? Yeah, I think, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think, especially in Shauna's case, um she's she's basically a sellout which seems like it has a negative connotation right especially for an artist but mm -hmm. she really like she's really talented first of all so you need talent to you need to have that core skill that people want so she's she's a really good painter she's a phenomenal painter but what she's done is honed her talent m more and more in line iteratively with what people want so she knows that she wants to make a living selling her paintings and her commissions. So she's seen what works and what doesn't through selling things and through posting things on social media. Mm -hmm. And is, she's kind of whole, like, she's basically, her style is based on what people want to buy from her. So she's, ba she's a sellout in like the best sense of the word, because if she wants to do this for a living, if she wants to, to support herself and support her family, then doing that is really, really smart because she's learned, okay, this is what people want. I'm going to give them that. Like if, and these people, they, they build in, and this is kind of what I hear from a lot of people. They're like, I've built a product and I don't know who to sell it to. And I'm always like, I don't know how to do that either. It feels like they've come at things from reverse. I know how to find and build an audience, listen to them and then make the things they want as opposed to making something and being like, okay, who needs this? I got, I got to go find some people. It's much hard. It's doable, but it's way harder to do it in that way. Well, it's interesting. You know, there's, there's the, like two, there's these two economic theories, right? You have supply side economics and demand side economics, and there's relevance to, to both. And that's where I look at, you know, there's context that's required as opposed to just being, you know, fully one side or fully the other, right? Because the, you know, says law, which is more of the, uh, you know, supply side economics, it's kind of like the entrepreneur goes out and kind of figures out, okay, what's the problem, right? Because it's the whole like, you know, Henry Ford, if you ask people what they want, they're going to say they want a faster horse. So it's like, they go out and figure out, okay, where's the problem? And how do I provide something that would be a better solution than what currently exists, right? But at the same time, you also have just those that may have a, an expertise that they're competing against, you know, something that already does exist to improve this feature or that feature. And so that's more demand side. It's really, it's just really interesting to see kind of uh, the positives and negatives of both, both theories, but going, you know, maybe getting back on track and going to, uh, you know, just, I would say your, your niche and this whole idea of a company of, of one, uh, like, first off, what do you, like, what do you, what do you uh, mean by that? And then how, how would you, you know, describe the impact that that would make for a person that isn't an entrepreneur that's just, you know, re reading the book and, and, and what they walk away with. Yeah. So I think I, the, the definition of company of one, because it is a bit like, it, it sounds like it's just a one person business, right? And yeah. it's, it's just like Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. Nowhere in it does he say you work four hours and then you stop working. It, it's more of a mindset. So company of one is, is a mindset where instead of assuming that growth is always good and always beneficial, we assume that growth can be, but is not always beneficial. So a company of one is simply a business that questions growth. And if the growth makes sense to be a one person business and stop there, then, Hey, that's great. In the book, I have tons of examples of companies that are way bigger than, than one person because growth in that case, like in the case of buffer and base camp, who I talk a lot about in the book, it makes sense that they're a business of 50, 60 people, because that's what is going to work for them, for their niche, for their audience, for their marketing, for everything. Right. So I think the, the benefit of being a company of one of questioning whether or not growth makes sense leads us in the direction, not of just this is what we should do as business owners, but more if we're running the business, if we're profitable, if we're making our customers happy, then how do we want to run our business? And I know for myself, I want a business that, that enriches my life, not a business that basically takes over my life. Yeah. So, and I know as well that for somebody like myself, I don't, I don't like managing other people and I'm not actually not very good at managing other people. So having a bunch of employees just wouldn't make sense. Instead, I hire contractors that are the top of their industry 
And so I don't have to manage them. I don't need to do anything. I just say, hey, here's the work, figure out how to do it and get it to me by this date. If there's a problem, then let's communicate about that. If not, I'm just assuming you're working and then you're gonna give me the work when you're done, which, which really works for the type of personality that, that I have and the type of business that I want, where I basically wanna have as much profit as possible with as little responsibility as possible. So what, what would you say the distinguishing factor is between, you know, what's driving you and what you're trying to achieve and, and uh, someone that does, uh, in a sense, think they have to have a big, uh, a big company to achieve their, their growth, right? Because I think that it comes down to, from what it sounds like, you know, you're, you're pursuing kind of a, a, a lifestyle, right? A way in which you operate and make money. And I would say still gr- grow in a sense, but not grow you know, necessarily, you know, horizontally, right? Grow, you're growing kind of more vertically. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge that and say that every business is a lifestyle business. Hmm, So if you work for a startup, you have a very specific lifestyle um, given you by the venture capitalists who are funding it. If you work for a corporate job, your bum is supposed to be in a seat nine to five in an office or a cubicle. So I think if every business is a lifestyle, then I think if you own your own business, you should be able to dictate to some degree, it's still work, you still have to do it Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you still have to make money, but we should be able to dictate kind of what we want our business to look like and how we want it to grow if we do. And I think the, what I see people coming up against when, when they hear about this is that they think that growth is always better. And in writing the book and in doing a ton of research, I've, I found that a lot of businesses that scaled too rapidly or too quickly or put scale and growth at, at the top of their priorities, they didn't last very long. Most, start, most startups don't last very long. The, the average life of a business on the S&P 500 is 15 years. Mm-hmm. I've been in business 20 years. I don't make nearly as much as any of those businesses, but I also want, my, my goal is a business that lasts, right? So I think that if, if we challenge this and think more about why we want the growth instead of just, well, I need to grow to be mm-hmm legitimate, then I think we can come to better conclusions. That's really interesting. I love how you, I love how you look at that. I mean, most, most people go in and they try to find employment, find their profession, find a career in order to have a lifestyle, but they don't go in necessarily defining, you know, what they, the lifestyle is that they want and then going out and using that perspective to search for a profession or a career. And in, in these days, what's amazing is that that is totally possible. And I think you, your book is, is saying, is saying that, so what have you maybe seen of those you know, you know, paradigm shifts of just someone that you know, is in a nine to five that is you know, in you know, just what we're taught or conditioned to think is a, a successful career, right? a successful life and, and has adopted some of your principles and your theories in relation to what, you know, what is possible with our more modern evolved uh, type of economy and society? Yeah, I th- I think that, and I see I see bigger businesses kind of moving away from this um, like command and control hierarchical way of of managing employees because it's not working. Like people are unhappy, people are leaving. The freelance economy is getting bigger and bigger every single year because businesses aren't adapting to what their employees or what kind of the mindset of workers want anymore. And I think for a bit, even if a big business doesn't want to basically be a company of literally one person, they're a big business, but if they adopt some of the mindsets that, that I've kind of laid out in the book in regards to things like giving more autonomy so people can maybe work flex hours if they still get their work done, or they can maybe work remotely if they have other family obligations that are also important in their lives. If they can start adopting more of like a results-based work environment, as opposed to a command and control where like task-based. Yeah. yeah, If I don't see you sitting at your desk, then I assume you're not working. It's like put some trust into people. And if people have feel that they're trusted, they'll feel more autonomy. They'll feel more ownership in the projects. They're probably going to do better work. So I I think that in order for big businesses even to succeed long term, they need to start to think about some of these things that I brought up in the book as it relates to um, autonomy and resilience and giving people the ownership in the projects that they're doing and the trust. No, and theory, the theory in relation to results, you know, results driven employment, I think is, is extremely powerful because 
I don't know. I, I just, I never liked school that much, right? Because it was, you know, being told what to do. And, you know, it's this hierarchical, like top down, like you have to learn this and you have to get a good grade. And if you don't get a good grade, like you're stupid. And, it, and I, I never, and that never resonated with me. And I think that is, you know, translated into the workplace, but I think there's more and more discontent associated with that way of being, you know, I don't even say led, ma- managed is the better is a better word. And so you're right. It's interesting how like the employee base is really evolving, especially with, you know, millennials and even kind of the up and coming generation where, you know, what's possible is this, you know, mix of lifestyle and, and work. And they're demanding that, you know, work from home. They're demanding, you know, f- uh, flexibility that didn't exist before. Now there's two you know, obviously the, t- the traditional business person would be like, oh, I don't want to do that because then you're not going to work if, if you're doing this, if you're doing this and you're doing this. But what's fascinating is that, you know, there are a lot of technologies that are helping to support, you know, the, the you know, enabling or, or transitioning from a bigger business that's, that's structured in the typical way to one of these, you know, a, a more flexible work uh, uh, workplace. So what, what are, maybe in your book or what are some things that you've seen as, those first steps for a business to transition to a more modern, uh, you know, versatile, uh, you know, professional environment. Yeah. I think going, going small, doing, taking iterative steps at first, I, I probably, I wouldn't suggest that any business go from the way they're working to a complete 180. I think that's going to cause chaos. <laughs> that's going to cause chaos. But I, I also think that when, when we're thinking about things like uh, like autonomy or remote work, it isn't, I think the opposite of, of the command and control style isn't autonomy, it's chaos and anarchy. And I think autonomy lives in the middle of that where if I have an autonomous team, they're not devoid of direction and just doing whatever they want whenever they want. They're still being told like this, like these are our common objectives, especially if it's a team, like these are the objectives our team has to meet. These are the deadlines our team has to meet. I'm not going to tell you how to meet those deadlines in like microscopic detail. I'm just going to say that this is what needs to be done. This is what I need you to do. Can you please do this? And is this, is this going to work for you? And then they, they're free to do the work as opposed to just like, Everybody just do what you want whenever you want. Like that's anarchy. That's not autonomy. So I, I understanding the the difference there is key. And then yeah, moving moving slowly and iteratively. Like maybe it's doing one day of flex or or remote work a week, seeing how it works, seeing what the impact is, seeing what can be improved, and then iterating on it. What are some what are some methods you found, or what do you explain in the book as far as coming up with what are what these results or these objectives are, so that you know, things transition from like a task and amount of work relative to, you know, the right work and the quality of, of work. Like what are, what are some things you talk about there that would be relevant to listeners? Yeah, I think making sure that there's still communication. I think that's probably the most important, that's the most important thing with any job really is communication. So if you're no longer sitting like next to everybody in the same in the same room or same shared office space or same open office space, then how are you going to communicate? And probably testing things because I know a lot of teams who've said, okay, well, if we're not working in the same room, then we have to be constantly connected with each other with tools like Slack. And that can create its own set of problems, right? Like if you have to always be on, always be checking Slack, always be looking at the messages, then how are you going to be doing that and working at the same time? Mm-hmm. Like maybe there's a way, and I think Buffer does this really well, where they have they may they ask that their employees reply within a day to things that aren't critical. So maybe you log into Slack two or three times a day and check those, or maybe you log into email. Same with Basecamp. They do the same thing where they basically say that you have to like reply, but not, or you don't have to, you if you're asked a question, you have to reply, but not instantly, like instantly makes you distracted, instantly takes you away from the core work you're doing. And in the book, I interviewed Jason Fried, the CEO of Basecamp. And he said that a manager's job is to protect their employees time which is kind of different from the way a lot of people think about management. But I think it makes sense because if managers are, are making sure that their employees have the time they need to do their work, then they aren't scheduling needless meetings. Sometimes meetings are needed, but maybe not 
all of the meetings all the time. Or maybe you don't need an hour block where people are just talking to talk to fill up the time. Maybe it can be like a, a 10 minute catch up. So I think thinking about, uh, thinking about that is really important. The other thing now that I'm talking about Basecamp that they do really well is they don't have shared calendars because what they found was that people would look at other people's shared calendars and if they didn't see time blocked off for something specific, they would assume they had free time <laughs> when really the time that wasn't blocked off was just time to work. Huh. So they don't share calendars with each other. If I, if, if we're at base camp and I need to talk to you, I ask you when is going to work instead of looking at your calendar and saying like, okay, well you have 15 minutes after mm -hmm. this call when really maybe you probably want to summarize this call or like do notes or, or work on what you're supposed to be working on. So I think things like that are really important to consider, especially if you're kind of new to this type of working. And that's, I know, you know, uh, Jason Fried, he wrote, didn't he, he wrote a book about remote working, but that was done a, a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah. And it's become, I mean, I, did, I think, I'm not sure when or who invented the gig economy, you know, but buzzword, but I've heard that being thrown, thrown around as, as well. Uh, but an article I read recently talked about how, you know, 70% of, mo of major companies above a certain size, I can't remember, will have some form of either remote workforce or contract force in the next, uh, next five, five years. So are you, are you also seeing kind of this growing, tr this growing trend? Obviously, he, you know, I think Jason started a number of years ago, but have you start seen this growing trend? And is it one of those inevitabilities or do you think that it's a, just a fad? Yeah, I think it's it's inevitable for some types of business. I think if you have a factory, like people need to show up to manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. So so that kind of thing, I think, is important. But the, those types of jobs are getting more and more scarce with robotics and AI. So I think the the movement from the industrial revolution of you require scale and volume to produce things at a reasonable price we're kind of moving more into, and Seth Godin has been talking about this forever as well, moving more into an information economy and information workers where we're, we're getting paid and we're being valued for the way that we can solve complex problems that I don't even know computers are ever gonna be able to solve. So being able to add a piece of a widget into a widget is still valuable in some cases, but those types of jobs are diminishing. Whereas the types of jobs where we have to use our ingenuity and our creativity, which I think is why the, the human race has, has become like the apex species, like that kind of thing it is what's becoming valued and important. And that kind of, like, I don't know how you automate that. How do you automate ingenuity, right? So I think in doing jobs like that, we are seeing the trend in how can those jobs work the best for the people doing them and for the companies they're working for. And a lot of this is still an experiment with things like, um, uh, row or rowy, however you pronounce it with the results base, with remote, with flex time, with all of that. It's still just a, still a lot of experimenting and we're still fairly new to this. And I think the trend now is going to be, because a lot of businesses are going remote now, the, the trend now is going to be, what can we do to make the remote work better? Because a lot of things have unintended consequences, like the Slack thing that I was talking to you about, yeah. where if you have to be on um, a synchronous chat all day, how are you going to be able to do work? Well, that's one of those, you know, there's a lot of, of, of kind of business rhythm type of books that are out there that really do organize the nature of communication. Because I think that's a big thing, right? Because, you know, top of mind, tip of tongue. I mean, you have this, you know, human tendency to like, you know, you're, you're present with your emotions and you've got to get an answer. Or you've got to interrupt this and disrupt this. And it becomes, you know, a, a frenzy and a mess. But, you know, Cameron Harold is one that I've found. I'm not sure if you know who, who he is, but it's, you know, he, he wrote the book Meetings Suck, right? And, and it's one of those ideas of, of how meetings are just a waste, a waste of time, right? And the organization around objectives and uh, key results and, you know, ensuring that, you know, people know what is the outcome that is being uh, requested or, or expected is, is huge, but maybe let, let's do this. You know, th this is just, a, it's a fascinating topic for me because I'm in the, I'm kind of right in the middle of this and, and I have a bunch of employees and a, a lease that's ending in a year and a half. And I don't want, you know, I, they want more. I want more, right. As far as flexibility is concerned, I believe that, you know, we can, we can achieve that to an extent, but I want to talk as, as if we were like the, you know, the, the typical employee, or let's say even the, the the person going into the workforce or even going into college. So let's say that, you know, you were just 
coming back from California, let's say you run a two hour flight and you had to have a conversation with a family and they were sending their child off to, off to college. What, what direction would you give that family as well as the child going to college, assuming that like they get a full ride? Like, what would you, what would, what would you say, say to them as it relates to your philosophy? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> college necessary. No, but <laughs> because I don't know, I, I didn't even go, I went to university for one year and yeah. then I, I left to work and I know a lot of people now and I know a lot of businesses too, that when they're hiring, they're looking less at formal education and more at how that person is going to fit into the culture of the business and how that person is able to problem solve. Like I was talking about where school used to be like, you used to have that you need, used to need that MBA to be like in C-suite kind of thing. And nowadays it's, it's not as much that. So, I mean, it is college, especially in, in the States where college is so expensive. Like, is it worth coming? Is it worth starting work with a mountain of debt? And I don't know, I, that would, that would be a tough, that'd be really tough for me. I, I have family that are going to be thinking about college in about five years. <laughs> like, Oh no, I don't know what I'm going to tell my own family members. Um, but I think that, yeah, that would be probably the, the main thing. And then I guess the other thing that I would think about it is how can you how can you figure out what makes you irreplaceable? Because you don't, especially because m most of my experience is in freelancing, not in the corporate world. It's like I, I, I needed to always think about what I could do so I wasn't just a freelancer that was like Googled or on, on a, on a job board. It's like, what could I do to make it so that the decision was just like one of one where it wasn't just like, I need to find a web designer. It's like, I need to see if Paul Jarvis is available. So what can you do to, 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 to basically come up with that scenario? And to do that, a lot of times it comes down to soft skills, not necessarily the specifics you learn in university, but hmm. Communication is a huge one. And I bring this up all the time because communication is what makes or breaks projects or teams or, or relationships, pretty much anything. So the ability to communicate, even with to bring a base camp again, they care a lot about how you can communicate on email because 90% of their communication is written. So being able to write without um, a plethora of emojis <laughs> for younger people, I think is, is really good. I think being able to explain why and when I was freelancing this was the the biggest thing it's like how can I explain why I've made certain decisions like if I'm pitching a, a mock-up to you and you've hired me to do a design it's can I explain to you why I've made the decisions that I've made and how that could benefit you right so or even like talking to people who are prospective clients like how can I explain why you should hire me as opposed to any other designer? And I'm not going to talk about things like, well, I know Photoshop or Sketch or Figma or HTML. No, I'm going to talk about things like, well, the, the last client that I worked with has seen doubled their revenue six, six months after we launched the project. Or I've worked with your business as a Fortune 500. I've worked with three other Fortune 500s and this is what I've done for them. Or if you want um, to, to speak to any of those as a reference, I can provide you with an email address of, of two people that I worked with last year. So things like that, things like soft skills, like being able to understand, empathize and communicate is what's getting people jobs right now. Like it's what's getting people hired as freelancers or as employees. Mm -hmm. And I think that you don't learn those things in school. Like I, when I was in university for one year, I was doing computer science. All I was doing was code and logic. I wasn't doing, like, I wish I had taken courses in like psychology and sociology and communication. I mean, I'm a writer now, but I, I have no formal training in writing. I wish I had a bit more, <laughs> I wish I had a bit more of that. But those salt, that's fascinating because soft skills, you know, it, it, what do you, what do you uh, think of when you hear soft skills? Like yeah. that, it's, it's not sexy, it's not important and it doesn't necessarily equate to intelligence. So why would I need to learn those? Right. But I totally agree. I totally agree with you. I mean, it, so, so far, I mean, I, I've hired, you know, hundreds of people and, you know, I've, I don't know with my current team, I don't know where they went to school. I never even looked at their like degree or their diploma or their, their, you know, we, we have, we use the wonderlick test before we even interview someone 
right? Which tests cognition, you know, leaders, uh, leadership and motivation. And it's fascinating just to kind of look at the, here's their resume, right? With all this stuff on there. And then here's their wonderlink test. And, and they're not often, you know, incongruent, you know, they're not congruent. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's, it's just a fascinating, just, I, I think, evolution associated with how people are working. And, uh, you know, and it's not what, you know, life was 100, 150 years ago, yet, in a sense, m mentally and, you know, psych psychologically, we still operate that, that way. Um, but, you know, it is, it is a transition, right? Because these days, you know, most people are still, they still have this thing pushed into their mind that they have to graduate, they have to get a job, they have to work for a company with benefits. They, and, you know, it's for, for you and I, we look at things and, and see that none of that is necessary. At the same time, you know, habits and ideas are some of the most powerful things on planet Earth, right? Mm -hmm. And getting them, you know, getting people to, to shift out of that often causes, often requires disruption as a, as a catalyst to that change. Cool. All right, Paul, you've been amazing. This is awesome. How can, how can we follow you? How can we learn more about what, what you're up to, best way to buy the book, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, the book's available pretty much everywhere around the world in hardcover at your local bookstore or on Amazon. I write a weekly newsletter. That's basically the best way to keep in touch with me um, on my website, pjrvs.com, or just Google Paul Jarvis. It's easier. Um, but yeah, that, those, are, those are the two best things to, to keep up with me at the moment. Sweet. All right, Paul, you've been awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, part, of your, uh, part of your wisdom. I think this will be a, a really, really good value add to some of our listeners. Thank you. Cool. No problem. Thanks for having me on.